Hello, everyone. Welcome to Green Sky Podcast. Um, I'm your host, Moen Giyashi, and uh, today we have uh, Mike Liss and Marian, my co-host. Hi, I'm Marian Hoffman. I'm a managing partner at Green Sky. Awesome. Mike, do you want to kick off with an introduction? Sure. Um, Mike List, I'm a managing partner at Green Sky as well, uh, one of the founders. Um, so Green Sky was founded back in 2008 um, as an exempt market dealer. So we, we basically were a, a group that were helping companies raise money and providing advisory services. By 2015, that had gone well enough that we began to raise money and put our first small fund together and subsequently have raised a fund every two years approximately. So we have, we are currently deploying our fifth fund and we plan on raising our sixth fund in Q1 of next year of 2024. Awesome. Mike, would you mind uh, give us about a bit of background about your experience over the past 20 years? Um, walk us through all the details. Sure. My, I, I, my story starts in the nineties, so I'm, I'm dating myself a little bit, but, um, uh, I am a recovering lawyer, so I went to law school in the 90s. Um, I articled with one of the big downtown uh, Bay Street firms. Um, I enjoyed the experience immensely, and I met a lot of really good people, but I realized quite quickly that um, private practice was probably not going to be for me. And so I left um, in 98 after my articles were done and started my first company, which we built. Uh, it was a legal information um website at the time. Basically, we packaged and delivered uh, legal information on kind of easy to access topics like Highway Traffic Act, um, basic incorporations, etc. Um, I'd like to say we were a bit ahead of our time. It, it I don't think was uh, the internet and, and kind of the market was ready for it. But we did manage to sell it um, in 2000, just before the dot com burst. So I got a kind of a taste of entrepreneurship. And have not looked back and i think i found it i think i'm at 16 or 17 different companies um notable ones include uh a, a computer distribution company so we bought hardware from taiwan and resold it into primarily education so kindergarten to grade 12 in the us and canada um, in the early 2000s uh went on to start a law firm in 06 uh, Ormston List Frawley, where I'm still a name partner, although I don't practice, um, but they are a corporate boutique here in Toronto. Um, started a currency exchange brokerage at the same time in 06 that we grew and sold in 09. Um, and my wife and I back in 03 started a, a daycare company. So we have, we bought up until about, we bought our last property in 2014, but we've been buying up properties all over Toronto. Um, at the height of that business, we had, I think, 150 employees and about 700 kids under care at seven different locations. We sold that business in 2018 and, and re retained the property. So we still manage the property, but the business now is run by a, a, a kind of a large um, multi-province daycare based in Calgary. Um, but I guess my background is, again, primarily entrepreneurial. I have a legal background and in about 2010, after... My first major exit, when we sold the currency exchange company, I began to make investments as an angel investor in technology startups. And so I moved kind of from an angel investor into becoming an institutional investor in 2015 and obviously since. And I do, I kind of, it's my throwaway line, but I often describe myself as somebody who sat at most of the seats at the table, if not all of them. Um, I've been the lawyer for investors as well as uh, those raising capital. And I have also raised capital and invested as an angel and institutional investor. So I, I've got a lot of experience in the in the startup ecosystem in Canada um, and certainly have kind of finally found, I think, what I like doing, which is meeting and interacting with people who are intelligent and doing really cool things with technology. Awesome. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. And, and Marion, since this is our first episode, would you, would you also mind introducing yourself? Yeah, sure. So uh, I joined Green Sky about a year ago. And before that, my background was largely in public equities. I spent just over 17 years at a Toronto based investment management firm called Siona, uh, where I was a member of the, the senior management team there. And we grew the business to about 5 billion in assets under management, uh, investing mostly on behalf of large institutions, but also uh, private individuals. And we invested primarily in Canadian public companies. Uh, in my role, I was the lead portfolio manager for their Canadian funds, and I was also the research director for the investment team. 
Uh, I joined Green Sky a year ago. Um, I'm helping out with evaluating new investments, uh, helping with the DD, the due diligence process, um, representing Green Sky on boards of some of our portfolio companies, um, and also helping with fundraising and investor outreach. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you both. I can, I can do a quick intro as well. Um, Moen Giyashi, I'm, I'm, I'm a principal with uh, Green Sky Ventures. I've joined the firm uh, uh, since 2021. Um, before Green Sky, I used to work at a medical device company based out of Toronto, which is now um, acquired by uh, Boston Scientific. Um, and before that, I worked at uh, Creative Destruction Lab as a venture manager with the Primus Dream. My background is primarily technical. I'm a material scientist uh, by training and a chemical engineer. Um, so I did my bachelor's in polymer processing and polymer engineering, like dealing with traditional plastic engineering and stuff. Did my master's at U of A, where my research was mainly focused on tailing ponds and the challenges with oil sands extraction. And then I did my PhD at U of T where my research was focused on 3D printing applications of biomaterials such as cellulose for 3D printing and applications in biological solutions. Yeah, so that's that's the, the three of us here today. Um, um, we have Mike List as our um, guest today and uh, he wants to share more about Green Sky and, and what Green Sky stands for, what is the history of Green Sky and where we come from. Um, I guess, Mike, the first question that I want you to um, maybe explain a bit to us is wh what is the history of Green Sky? How did this start? So Green Sky started on the side of an ultimate field. Um, myself and the, co the other co-founder, <clears throat> a gentleman by the name of Jeff Simonette, have known each other since our days at Queens um, and had done a bunch of work together, but continued to play ultimate Frisbee together. And we were in British Columbia in 2008 at the World Championships um, and banging around ideas about kind of what was next and what kind of fun things we could do together. And we thought it would be interesting to try to put a platform in place to kind of help um, to act as a catalyst for startups. Um, we, we'd done a bit of investing at that point. Jeff had had a successful exit as well um, from a, a computer software company that he'd helped found in the early 2000s. So we both had a little bit of capital that we were looking to put to work. And we used Green Sky um, originally as a way to, for us and then an, a, a kind of an ever in, increasing and expanding network to do that. So really the history of Green Sky is originally at least was to try to put a vehicle together that would allow us to invest our capital and allow our network to invest their capital into interesting startups here in Canada. Awesome. That's great. So and 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 Mike, if you if you want to discuss a bit about the thesis that Green Sky has, like what do we do? What do we invest in? What do we like to see? What what is the thesis? Sure. Um so Green Sky, I mean, obviously, having been around since late 08 or 09, um, has evolved quite a bit since the inception. Initially, as I mentioned earlier, Green Sky was an exempt market dealer. So the focus was really trying to um, more almost like a, a small merchant bank was was trying to find really interesting companies that we can invest both time and money in and help grow quickly. Um, and we kind of thought, given our, our skill sets, Jeff and I, um, that and the fact that we both kind of successfully exited at that time uh, a couple of businesses, that we could, you know, we were well placed to do that. Fast forward to 2023, we don't do that type of work anymore. So we do no advisory. We're uh, Green Sky is rebranded now as Green Sky Ventures. We're a straight venture fund. Um, I would say that our investment thesis is a, is a little bit different than the, the average. Um, investor in the Canadian ecosystem. Our belief is that um, we're, we sit at the opposite end of the spectrum from kind of a, a, a an, an indexing type approach. We don't try to invest in a lot of companies and invest small amounts. We more often make very large bets. And for us, that would be in a pre-seed or seed round about a million and a half. So we, we almost always are the lead in, this, in the seed rounds in which we, we participate. Um, but we're trying to make very educated bets and make smaller numbers of bets with larger amounts of money. And the way that we do that is we, we spend a lot of time prior to writing a check, interacting, <clears throat> excuse me, with the, with the C-suite and the company founders. And we, we do a significant amount of due diligence. And the idea is that we think we can 
given our experience and how long we've been at this, we have a better shot at picking winners and avoiding picking losers. And therefore, the larger amounts of capital we commit to each of those investments, um, we tend to have less failures inside the portfolio. An example of that um, is that we made our first fund one investments in 2015. I think now we're at 28 total companies in the portfolio across those five funds. And to date, and I'm not saying this will continue forever, but to date, we've only had one failure. The data that we can find in the marketplace suggests that most companies um, fail to raise a follow on round about in about two thirds of cases. So really only about a third of companies make it from friends and family to their next round of capital. In the case of Green Sky, we have yet to have a company fail to raise money and we've only had one business failure. The odds that we see in the statistics inside the portfolio are obviously markedly different than what we're seeing in the general marketplace. And our view is that the approach that we take, which is again, a lot more measured, careful, it's measured twice, cut once, is one that is working. Awesome. That's uh, that's great. And, and Marion, you've you've joined us for the past year. I, I'm very curious to hear what you think is Green Sky's thesis, and what you think um, separates Green Sky from other investment firms. Yeah, I'll 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 speak to maybe a, a number of different points there. Um, I think one of the key differentiators for Green Sky is is the team. Obviously, the people is it's the greatest asset. Um, and one of the things that really drew me to the firm um, was the tremendous breadth and depth of the talent on the team. Um, I think that the team really believes in having um, social and cognitive diversity, having people around the table who have different backgrounds, experiences, educations, um, and that that provides a competitive advantage um, and that the, the diversity of the team is, is really been a key contributor to the firm's outside, outside investment returns. And so I think that's a really big, big piece of, of what makes Green Sky unique. Um, I would say, uh, you know, to, to echo some of the, the points that Mike already made, um, the depth of the due diligence, um, having come from a shop that very much did, we did all our own in-house fundamental research and really believed in, in diving down and doing our own homework, seeing the, the, the depth, the rigor, um, and the kind of work that Green Sky does on that front, I think is, is a real differentiator. I don't think a lot of other shops are doing that degree of, of disciplined and, and very structured investment research, um, particularly at this stage uh, in, the, in, in the venture space. I think that's something that's, that's really unique, the amount of man hours that are put towards that um, and the, the time spent there. And I think that the results uh, of that work show both in terms of Mike what talked about in terms of the, the lower failure rate and just the overall investment results over the long term, I think show that. Awesome. Um, so I guess one of the questions that I have is about the culture at, at Green Sky. And this is, this is probably more, and Mike usually calls this how the sausage is made. So um, so I, 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 I want to basically ask you to tell me what you think is the culture within the team. And this is not something that, let's say, startups, LPs um, know of uh, just because it's the day to day of the operation. But I'm curious to hear um, maybe, Mike, uh, from you, what do you think is the culture? So I think that there are a number of things. Um, I guess the first would be. Um, we have always sought out people that are intelligent, straightforward, and honest. And I'd like to think that we are uniquely so at Green Sky. So there is a, certainly I have tried and, and, and Greg, the other managing partner, um, and increasing, increasingly Marion, as she gets more and more involved, I think have tried to encourage everybody to feel like they have an opportunity to speak plainly and openly about what they think. I also personally think that groups that I have been involved in where everyone simply agrees or where there's one loud voice that everyone always agrees with don't tend to arrive at as often as healthy a series of decisions as groups that are free to disagree internally. I think that some amount of disagreement and discussion actually is a very good thing and it promotes um, a form of critical thinking that is important. I think in many larger organizations, that's one of the first things to go. And it's, it's kind of a shame in my opinion. And so 
given the size of the team at Green Sky, which is, I think we're now nine people, um, it's been it's been something that's been relatively easy, just given the smaller, relatively smaller group to promote. But it really is something that I think is pretty critical. It does allow us to um, really put on the crucible a lot of ideas and, and decisions that are given a good hearty kick before we kind of decide to actually, from a tactical perspective, engage and move forward. And I think that type of approach has been important. And, you know, Mo and I would, I guess I would ask you in turn, given that you're kind of a younger team member of the three of us on the call, um, you know, in the spirit of what I've just said, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, you've now been with us for a couple of years and you've seen this in action. What, what, what have you thought? How have you felt that that is kind of that execution has happened? Um, so I, I, I think of Green Sky's culture in um, definitely two main areas. One, one is the fact that being able to openly express what you think, just because we have people around the table who have different backgrounds, different experiences, and, and we want to hear everybody's point of view. And as you said, if everybody is aligned, then the thing that venture capital stands for, which is contrarian view, is, is basically gone and everybody is mutually agreeing on whatever is happening. That is that is definitely um, um, an area that Green Sky is, excels at. You have people with legal, financial, technical, different types of technology backgrounds. Um, we have people who are coming from different cultures, just different points of view. And, and we always welcome and push each other to make sure that we hear everybody's opinion before going forward and making a decision. And, and until unless everybody um, kind of brings out what they think about the, um, let's say, the uh, company that we are looking into investing, we won't move forward to to a decision. We want to make sure everybody is heard. We want to make sure everybody um, expresses their uh, opinion, and then we we come up with uh, with a unanimous decision. That's that's one thing that I've obviously seen. It's again coming into venture capital without the finance background. I always felt that I'm I'm not enough, but like like coming in and, and feeling that my opinion is, has value and my opinion being different is actually probably more valuable than another finance person coming in and sitting at the table um, gave me a lot of confidence to like make sure that I express what I Well, what when I you, can, you can only um, have so many lawyers and finance people in, in one barrel. You actually need some people to do real work and actually think real thoughts. So we're, we're thrilled to have you. So yeah, that's that's definitely one. The second one for me, again, um, joining the firm over the past three years, being like starting as at like an associate and junior level. I think the culture of learning and education and support is very, was very important for me. So like when I came in, um, I worked directly with Greg. I worked a lot on on due diligence. Obviously, I worked on very technical due diligences. But what I think um, I liked the most was. Greg trying to hold hand, helping me understand the concepts and fundamentals. And, and let's say at a point that the team realized that it would be beneficial for me to do a CFA level one, the team supported me to do a CFA level one. At a time that the team believed that it would be beneficial for me to take a course to support the um, board responsibilities, then, then I did that with the help of the team. So I think that culture of learning and support is, is also what uh, what separates us. Again, it's a small team. We have to make sure that everybody is heard and understood. And if somebody needs improvement in something, it's it's just because they are they're coming with a different background. And we need to support them to um, to kind of strengthen that muscle. I guess I'll, I'll put, put this question in front of Marion. Um, you've joined us over the past year. What what do you think is, is the culture and what do you think uh, about like expressing our opinion and like having the contrarian view and, and valuing that? Uh, you know, I would I would echo a lot of the same uh, points. You know, if, if you'd asked me, how would I characterize the green sky culture? I would have said that it's a culture of candor and a culture of curiosity, which very much um, is aligned with the way you both described it. Um, on the candor front, you know, it's about celebrating differences among the team members. It's about being encouraged um, to put forward contrary views, that that's, that's something that we want to hear. Um, and I think senior members very much try to encourage, um, you know, some of the more junior members to really put forward different viewpoints, challenge assumptions, don't just take things at face value um, and really trying to model uh, a form of communication that involves, you know, that respectful dissent kind of engagement, which I think is really important. 
Um, so I, I, that's kind of on the, the the candor side of things. And then on the curiosity, I think as well, that picks up a lot of what you were talking about, Moen, about you know, being encouraged, learn more, expand your knowledge base, you know, dive deeply into various different sectors, into different markets and continue learning and broadening um, that knowledge base. And that that's perpetually encouraged and and something that's that's really core uh, value at the firm. Awesome. So when I joined Green Sky, one of the things that I realized was that the managing partners and the teams are all also LPs of the fund. Um, and, and that was something that, that really, uh, was, was interesting for me, just like seeing the, the team is not only working, let's say for the LPs to like grow the fund and like, make sure that they, they make good investments and, and rely on, let's say carry and, and, uh, the reward that way, but also they do invest, uh, a hu- like a huge portion of the, uh, the money that goes into the fund is, is from friends and family and, and the LPs. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious, Mike. What do you think about that? How do you think that changes Green Sky, um, and how would how would that basically affect, let's say, an LP's decision in joining the fund? So you're you're setting me up for all my best one-liners, but I often joke when I'm pitching the fund to new LPs that I can never go anywhere because my father-in-law is a multiple-time investor in 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 our last three funds, and so until I get his money out, which we actually have already at this point, but um, yeah, I mean it's a great question. I'll tell you, it is one of the things that as we have increasingly attracted some of the attention of larger institutional funds of funds, that is noteworthy for them. Um, You know, Marion and I both have participated in a lot of these calls and Marion jump in, but it seems to me like it's one of the things that really tweaks their interest when you can say of the total capital raised since 2015, approximately a quarter of it has come from the general partner insider. So myself, Greg, you, um, our investment committee members, et cetera, and, or our families or our family trust, et cetera. But you know, that, that's a, that's a pretty remarkable percentage by comparison to some of the other players out there doing what we do. Um, and certainly with your background as well in the public markets, I mean, you would have seen some of this as well. The funds you were dealing with, there were quite a bit bigger. So you would likely never see one single, individual at anywhere near 25%, but I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. I mean, I I do think it's pretty unique. I I would certainly um, say the same thing. I I think having worked, um, you know, the longer you work in the investment management space, the the more you come to recognize how having alignment of interest between um, an investor and their their investment manager or whoever's helping them with their investments is, is so critical and that it's actually it's, it's hard to do. It's hard to create the right incentive um, schemes and, and or, or programs in order to ensure that there is that really direct alignment of interests and that, you know, you're not creating unintended consequences from that. And so that's something that um, having been in the business, it's, it's you spend a lot of time trying to manage it within your team, within, you know, the, the companies that you're investing in. What does their compensation program look like? What kind of alignment do you have with them? Um, because it really drives human behavior in so many different ways. Um, and it can drive the, the course of, of an investment. And I think what's really um, uh, special about the way that Green Sky has approached it is that it's just a very clean, direct approach. You know, as, as Moen, as you said, you know, the, that the, the, the team themselves make up 25% of the invested capital. So we are LPs along with our investors. It doesn't get uh, any cleaner than that. And, and the investment world is ripe with creating all sorts of artificial ownership and, and various different performance shares or like there's a million different ways um, to try to um, simulate being uh, uh, an owner alongside, simulate being just sitting in the same seat, but nothing can simulate the same way as just we put in our dollars just the same way you have. Um, and so I think that that's, um, that's, that's the best way to make sure that our, our incentives are, are totally aligned with our investors because we're investors as, as along with them. Maybe I'll, I'll just change the subject slightly. Um, I, I'd like to hear both Mo and your thoughts and, and Mike as well on um, Green Sky's approach to investing in, in deep technology because that's something that I think Green Sky has, has leaned into more so than some of their some of the other players in the, the early stage venture space. So I'd like to kind of hear, um, you know, your thoughts on on how Green Sky approaches that investment space. Mike, okay, sure. Yeah, um, I mean, so um, 
I think I'm, first of all, I'm very, uh, feel very pr privileged and, and excited that I lead the deep tech investments on the, on the lead intake. So it, um, I'm, I'm basically the face of green sky, like talking to a lot of the deep tech founders. Um, I definitely, one of the things that I hear from them is that they're, they're very excited to talk to someone or a team who are technical enough to understand the technology. And always when I talk to a very technical founder, they, they express, um, that, whoever they talked to before me didn't really understand the technology. And like we usually bring the founders to have a conversation with our technology partner, Waldus Martinsons. I think you don't really find people with that many years of experience as CTOs in like various different types of fields from manufacturing to IT to ICT and, and Waldus combines all of that together. And like when he talks to founders, he really pinpoints a lot of the challenges that they're facing or he predicts what they're going to go through in the near future, which which definitely helps us a lot in understanding the technology, understanding the challenges during the due diligence, but also preparing us as as partners of the company even when we invest in the company to to be alongside them and expect what is going going to go wrong and and like not be shocked when eight months down the road the CTO of the company leaves because Valdis has predicted that this this is gonna happen. I think that's that's uh, that's one of the exciting parts when I when I talk to a lot of the founders, that kind of that's kind of the feedback that I get. But I think overall in venture industry what has happened is that a lot of folks over the years have made their money from software. And and obviously they um, they don't have the diversity and the capability in their team to be able to dive deep into very, very technical companies. Like they don't have multiple PhDs as advisors and team members. They don't have many years, someone with many years of experience as CTOs. Um, and not just CTOs of like software businesses, but CTOs of let's say a hardware, like hardcore manufacturing company. Um, and so not having that capability means that it's very difficult for them to evaluate a deep tech um, uh, company and evaluate a deep tech um, opportunity. And I think as the barrier to entry for software is lowering the um, where there is a lot of inefficiencies in the market is going to be in, in the deep tech side, where it's very difficult to understand who's going to be the winner, where it's difficult to understand what does the technology really do, what problem it solves. Um, and the challenge is that we just need more of the deep, ter deep tech solutions to be able to solve the problems. And software is exciting it has eaten the world and it's going to continue to eat the world but now it's the time that we need very technical um solutions for the massive problems that the uh, world is facing but that that's so that's that's what i what i see that that's what uh, that's my opinion but excited to hear what mike thinks i mean i largely agree and i would go a step further and say simply the data. So the numbers, when you look at the multiples applied to enterprise SaaS in particular, over the last five years, we saw a massive bump in the, in the multiples. This is one of the indexes that we use to try to determine value as we're, as we're kind of pricing risk and investing our own money, that the multiples were at an all time high in 21, early 2022. Um, I think they've come back down and may, quite frankly, have come back down even below historic averages. But at the end of the day, it's unlikely that we're going to see multiples where they were during that period. And so I guess I'm agreeing with you, Moen, and adding a layer of, of kind of quantifiable argument to your kind of assertion that, you know, the enterprise SaaS and the software piece, it's not done. And, and in our funds, just as kind of a, I guess, as a, as a note, we do both. We don't invest solely in deep tech. We have in each fund a sprinkling of enterprise SaaS, kind of scalable and recurring revenue streams, as well as kind of more disruptive, what we call deep tech. So really more plays directly on the power of the technology itself. I do think that the world is moving away, if for no other reason than the multiples simply aren't there anymore, from the almost singular focus during COVID that we had on enterprise SaaS and kind of that recurring revenue stream to understanding that the, some of this disruptive deep technology really is got the potential to produce outsized returns. And that, that kind of thesis remains to be proven. So certainly as we continue to do these, I hope to be able to come back to you and say, see, let's go back to that first episode where I said that I told you, but time will tell. Um, 
I do think though that when we talk about deep tech, what we're typically talking about, and and this is you know in a way somewhat of a self-serving description, but this is how it evolved at Green Sky, you know, ages ago. We realized that there there were pockets of technology companies at such an early stage that they weren't going to attract the attention of large investors that had an ability to due diligence them properly. Meaning that when you have a company that's so early, you're not going to have, you know, a large fund that's typically writing 20 or 30 or plus million dollar checks looking closely at that company. And as a result, the investors in those businesses at an early stage tend to be angel investors. What Green Sky has done is kind of uh, put itself as kind of I view us as one of the leaders in, in Canada but as a leader in that early stage deep tech space. And the reason why I think we've had success there is because there simply aren't a lot of folks able to do what we do, which is to say there aren't people willing to make large bets, small number of them, but base that on a deep analysis of the actual underlying technology. And this gets back to Mona point you made earlier. One of the really critical pieces to our ability to get there and remain there has been Valdis. I mean, for those, listening that don't know who Valdis is. Valdis is our chief technologist. Um, he's been with us since 2016 or 2015 even, um, since the first fund. But he is one of the most experienced technology uh, minds that I've had the, uh, the pleasure of working with ever. So he was the, uh, he was a CTO of a uh, chipset manufacturing company. He then went on to be the first outside hire at Research in Motion, so at BlackBerry. And he was responsible for kind of shepherding them through their massive growth between 2000 and 2005. He then was Richard Branson's first hire at Virgin Mobile um, and helped grow and then have that company. I believe it was sold to either Telus or Bell. I can't remember who bought it, but, um, and then finally went on to um, uh, also has been involved in being the chief technologist at, a, at, a, at an auto parts manufacturer. So his experiences kind of spans the gamut of, of both hard manufacturing, um, at RIM and Telecom, but like through a, a variety of different verticals, he has been at the forefront of watching companies go through these extreme growth periods. And what it allows him to do for us is two things. First, he is a, an absolutely invaluable resource for identifying a technology talent and, and interesting technologies before we write a check. And he is as critical um, mentoring and coaching companies through inflection points once they're in their portfolio, and I, I've lost count of the number of, of members of the C-suite um, on our portfolio companies that have kind of said like, wow, it's just been amazing being able to work with Valdis. And I think you've experienced this moment firsthand on some of these calls and meetings, but he really has been a huge driver for value for us over the years. And, and we're really fortunate to have him, particularly as we're continuing to lean into that deep tech um, side of our investment. Awesome. This, uh, this was great. Thank you so much, Mike, for being with us for the first episode, telling us a bit more about Green Sky. And thank you, Marian, for co-hosting with me. No problem. Thanks very much, guys.